In accordance with the customs of this university, I open the ceremony with a prayer. Spiritus Sancti Gratia Illuminet Sensus et Corda Nostra. Please take your seat. So first, a uh, uh, welcome to everyone. It's really nice to have the opportunity to have live defenses again and to have a, a live audience. But in the corona period, we also learned that it's really nice to have remote participants in the defense. So uh, we have now a mix of uh, the top international experts who take part uh, from a distance without having to travel and the people who um, are of course also top experts, but in the opportunity to travel to Nijmegen. And uh, we're really happy with this new type of uh, defense, which I think uh, uh, is, uh, is a really nice benefit of the past period that we learned how to do this. So now I think it is time to really start uh, the defense and I will give the floor to the candidate for the degree of doctor. With the permission of the doctorate board and in order to obtain a degree of doctor from Radboud University in Nijmegen, I would like to defend in public my dissertation titled Polynomial Multiplication for Post-Quantum Cryptography. In the next couple of minutes, I would like to talk about what I've been up to for the last couple of years. And I would like to go through my title in reverse. So I'd start with cryptography. So I think we all have some understanding on what cryptography is, but actually, let me give you one example here. So when I send you this invitation to my defense, I also send a link to my PhD thesis. And you, of course, all went to my website and downloaded this PhD thesis to carefully read every single page. And when doing that, you actually were using cryptography. Actually, you were quite using quite a lot of cryptography. And you can make your browser also show you what cryptography you're using. So first of all, you were using encryption to guarantee the confidentiality of, of the thesis that you downloaded, to make sure that no one else can read what you're, read, what you're receiving there. Okay, for a thesis, that's maybe not so relevant, but think of other things that you retrieve from a web server that is more confidential. Then you've, so what you've been using for that is um, encryption called ChaCha20. Then you have been using something to authenticate this data so that you can be sure that no one modified this this thesis in transport, which is maybe more important for a PhD thesis. What you've been using for that is poly 1305. And actually for both these things, you needed to first have a symmetric shared secret key with my web server. And to get that, you've been using a key exchange. In this case, this was called X25519. And to make this key exchange work, work you also used signatures for RSA. So that's quite a lot of cryptography that you've been using just to download my thesis. And for anything else you do on the internet, this is similar. Let me give you another example. When you use instant messaging like Signal, you're using kind of the similar, the similar um, routines. You use a key exchange. It's slightly different schemes, but it's, um, it's very similar. Let me move on to the next word in the title of my thesis, quantum. So you probably heard in some news reports about quantum computers, like Google building a big quantum computer, achieving what they call quantum supremacy, doing something with a quantum computer that no normal computer could do. Even though it's maybe not a very useful thing that they were doing, but there is a lot of progress on quantum computers and they keep getting bigger. China is working on quantum computers. IBM is big on quantum computers. So there's a lot of technical progress on developing large-scale quantum computers. So the question you will ask here is what's the, the impact of that? And one impact that it has is it impacts cryptography. So part of our cryptography that we are using is going to be broken by these quantum computers due to an algorithm called Schoß algorithm, which breaks some of this cryptography being used. So in, in the examples I gave, the key exchange and the signatures will be completely broken by quantum computers. But the other part, the symmetry we call symmetric, is not affected by Schoß algorithm. But still, we have a problem because half of the, what we're using there is broken. 
So then the logical question to ask is, when will these quantum computers be large enough to break something like this? Because now, right now they're very small, they're very tiny, but at some point they might get large <coughs> enough to actually break the stuff we're using. And that's a very interesting question to ask. There's no consensus on what, when will, that will happen. I think the predict predictions are something like in the next 10 years, to some people say this will never happen. There's, it's too hard to build a quantum computer. And I think in my committee, if I, if I know correctly, we have the entire spectrum from people that think it's going to happen in the next 10 years to people that think it will never happen. But I think most experts agree that there is a chance that we will have one. We're not sure if we'll have one, but there might be one. And one other thing that we need to keep in mind is, is that if someone is now recording all the encrypted data, they can just store it and then wait until they have a quantum computer and decrypt everything. So that's why we need to act much earlier than when we have a quantum computer. So we need to replace this broken crypto soon so that we can have uh, confidential data in the future. That brings me to post-quantum cryptography and that is the cryptography, the public key cryptography that is resistant to attacks by quantum computers. And they all, it also needs to be resistant to attacks by normal computers. And what's also important is it needs to be able to run on classical computers because we need to use it much earlier than we have a quantum computer. That brings me closer to my research. Um, well aligned with my PhD, there was a project by the US National Institute for Standards and Technology and they were searching for replacements for these key exchange and signature schemes that uh, I've shared in, in the slides before. And it actually started in 2016 and the deadline was uh, in 2017, just when I started my PhD. Um, so that was kind of, um, most of my research was about the schemes that were in this competition. Um, and then later in 2019, they, they kicked out a bunch of the submissions and then went down to 26 schemes. And then in 2020, they cut it down to 15 schemes. And now in um, March this year, they were going to announce the final decisions on what they want to standardize. Um, so far, they have not announced what is going to be standardized, but it should happen in March. So let's see when that will happen. It should be very soon now. And what I've been mostly working on is lattice-based cryptography. Um, so that's one family of these post-quantum post cryptography. And in relative to the other families, it's as like medium public key and ciphertext sizes, and it's incredibly fast. And in this um, NIST post-quantum competition, there are currently five finalists, three, uh, three key exchange schemes and two signature schemes. And I've, in my thesis, implemented um, four of them. And what this, this all boils down to is uh, polynomial multiplication. So the core arithmetic operation in all these schemes is polynomial multiplication. So if you can implement that very fast, then you will have very fast crypto. And that's what my thesis is about. In particular, I've been looking at implementing these on very small ARM microcontrollers. In particular, the ARM Cortex M4. I've put a picture here. Just to give you some idea how large these are, so this has roughly a megabyte of flash and 192 kilobytes of SRAM. So this is much smaller than, say, a smartphone or a laptop. And, but we still need cryptography on them, so it's important to understand how lattice-based crypto performs on it. And that's what my thesis is also about. So I first give some, some background on polynomial multiplication, and then this applies to a couple of, of schemes that we've implemented in the other, scheme, other chapters. And now you still don't really know what we are doing there, but um, what it all comes down to is writing very fast code for this polynomial multiplication. And I've put some assembly code here that we've written for one of the papers. So that's what, what we are doing there. We, we find a, a dominating operation in these schemes and then make it very fast using assembly. And you might wonder why there is a butterfly on my thesis. And that's actually because one of the algorithms we use in these um, is the number theoretic transform, which is related to fast Fourier transforms that you might remember from school. And these are actually, in there, we are implementing what's called a butterfly operation, and that's why butterflies are our thing. 
I've also done uh, a couple of other um, papers that didn't make it into my thesis. We can discuss them over a beer another time. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And having presented the summary of my dissertation, I return the floor to the rector. Thank you, candidate. Um, so now we continue with the actual defense. And I would first like to give the opponents the chance who are uh, traveled to Nijmegen. Um, and we start usually in the inverse order of uh, distance from Nijmegen. And I'm not 100% sure that we did this correct. But we start with uh, Professor Verbouwede from KU Leuven. Um, and I now give the floor uh, to you. Thank you, Rector. Geachte promovendus, eh? um, congratulations with your work. It was a very interesting read. Um, and uh, now it's time to ask a couple of questions. So the first question I have is a general question, uh, it's a warm-up question. Um, so you, at several points in your thesis, you write that your techniques also help in reducing energy because most of these small microcontrollers end up in portable devices. What's so specific or what do you do different for energy optimizations than, say, for instance, for speed or area or something? Honor, Madam, thanks uh, for your kind words. Um, well, on these, on these devices, I think it, it boils down to if you use less cycles, you will use less energy. So optimizing for speed and for, um, for energy is similar on these very simple devices where the instruction set is very simple and they will all consume roughly the same amount of energy. So I think that's, that's the same. Um, some people say that um, it's especially memory accesses which might be memory hungry compared to actual calculations. Is that also your observation? I have never never looked into how that works, but memory accesses are also taking time. So um, we always optimize memory accesses as well. So, so that would go hand in hand there. OK. Um, um, my next question then is uh, on the um, systematic approach. So now you have done a huge amount of hand coding, beautiful assembly code, I would say, for both M4 and M3. Um, now, what happens if, um, can I reuse it, or what are other procedures I could implement, some design automation, it's called, that um, the assembly is more quickly optimized? Um, for instance, to systematic approach, for instance, to re reduce register usage or to reduce the stack size, or which steps would you do first, and can you make bring some systematic approach in it? So actually, in one of the papers where we implemented Tomb, Tomb Cook and Karatsuba multiplication there, we had a more systematic approach. So we, um, we generated all of the of the code for two and for Ketsuba so that it would work in different combinations of those. Um, so there we, we tried a lot of, of things and it's fully automated. And that also, I mean, in this paper, we implemented five different different schemes. So where we kind of had to do this because otherwise it would have been too much work. So there you can basically just throw in a, a degree for a polynomial and it will spit out the, the code that would multiply the polynomials, and then you can see which combinations of tomb and Kertsuba are the fastest, and at which point you want to switch to schoolbook multiplication. Um, so there I think we've, we've done this. Um, for the other papers, mm. so if I think of, of Kyber, Delithium, or Sabre, or something like this, there you have the big advantage that, that um, for all parameter sets, the polynomials have the same size, so you have to implement it once, and then you can use it um, for all the parameters set. So there, it, it makes sense to hand optimize it to the, to, yeah, hand optimize everything. So there it's, it's not directly uh, very general. But um, what we've done in, in the chapter where we implemented uh, Saber with entities, there you actually see that um, you can reuse quite some of the entity code that you, for example, use in Delithium and use that to write an implementation for Sabre. 
So there is um, a lot of code you can reuse. Mm, yes, that's code reuse, but say, I'm sure after the NIST competition is over, there's gonna come variations eh, on all these post quantum lead space schemes. Eh? Uh, higher security levels, lower security levels, uh, higher throughput, uh, lower latency, all these things. Um, if I want to get some systemization, which steps do I do I do first? How do I get to, I'm a new person, how do I get to this most optimal code? What's the first step you do? So you have a new um, scheme a, that uses a new a variations which uses entity. Which uses entity. Yes, let's limit to entity. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's uh, not very hard to adapt the entity code to, let's say, a different polynomial size. Mm -hmm. um, Is it just so changing the boundaries then in, in my loops or? Yeah, for some of the code, you can just change the loop uh, currently. For others, you will have to copy and paste a, a lot of code. But um, in general, that, that shouldn't be too hard. If it's like a power of two entity, like then it should be very easy. Yes. If it's not a power of two, then you have to use some other tricks. Um, yes, then it becomes interesting. Eh? There it becomes interesting, <laughs> but there it's also harder to, to have a systematic way of doing it. And then it needs okay. a lot of thinking. Okay. Um, do you have specific tricks to say um, reduce register usage or reduce the stack size? Um, yeah, so in, in some of the papers we, we optimized for stack size, um, in particular for the, the lithium. This is, is quite interesting because that is quite hungry in, in stack. Mm -hmm. So there we've, we've uh, proposed a couple of time space trade-offs that you can, can implement. Um, for for the the last two chapters, there we didn't really look into stack usage for, for Saber and Andrew, but there have been follow-up papers and where we where we look more into into stack usage. They also asked about register. Yes, um, is that an issue? Or I mean, that is always into... an issue that you run out of registers. Okay. Um, so to get fast code, you will you will need to optimize for having the best use of your registers. And which are the first ones you spill? How do you decide which ones to keep and which ones to spill to memory? So ideally, you want to you want to design your entity in a way that you don't really have to spill much. So you you want to um, merge your computations in a way that there's there's no real spills or as little spills as possible. Um, but for entities, since it's such a regular structure, it's it's kind of obvious how you do it. You, you load as many as you can fit in your registers, you do your butterflies, and then you store it back. That, that's kind of natural how that, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, do you, I mean, um, that's maybe a related question. Um, do you, in, in um, processors also evolve? Even if I have an old generation to a new generation, the, the uh, instruction set stays the same, but the micro instructions might st uh, change. For instance, there might be pipeline bubbles, things like that. Do you take that into account or not? Um, we've done some work also on the Cortex M3, which is quite um, a different, um, well, it has less instructions. Um, and it, you can't use the, the long multiplier because it's not constant time. But I think this is hard to write code that that would be good for both the Cortex-M3 and the Cortex-M4, because if I have an M4, I really want to use these instructions because they're very useful. Mm -hmm. So I think this is hard to take into account. We've now also, now looking more into the newer M-profile ARM cores, where you then also have more vector instructions, but I think this needs, needs more, more work to, to look into, into. You cannot just write code that will work well on the M4 and the M55 or something like this. Have you seen implementations for M4, which maybe older generations were constant time, and now these ones, they kind of optimize internally, or they're all exactly cycle-wise the same? I mean, production-wise, I mean, eh? they all have the same instruction set. I'm not sure if, uh, can, can you give an example of? Um... I don't have a an example by now, but um, we have seen processors that in older generations, so maybe old technology, 
uh, has a fixed number of cycles to finish a multiplication, but now it's the same instruction set, but it goes to a new uh, technology. It might have either uh, reduced uh, more pipeline stages or some intelligence inside that does early, early com uh, completion, things like that. While the instruction itself remains the same, right? It's, for instance, the case in risk fives, but I don't know for M4. On ARM, I've not seen it this way. Okay. Um, so, so in the M3, you have this, that it's not constant time, but then on the M4, you have the same instruction and it just takes one cycle. So it seems like they just put in a lot more multipliers yes. and uh, then it's constant time. Um, to the newer ones, um, I've not seen any instruction turn from not constant time to, uh, from constant time to into non-constant time. Is that something you test each time? Well, ideally, you have a you have a manual from ARM that uh, tells you how many instructions that takes. Um, and for these, for the M4, you cannot get all the cycle counts that, that's in the manual. You you don't need to benchmark that. Okay. For other cores, there are sometimes not so great documentation, but I didn't encounter that in, in the work. Here. Okay. Yes, that's nice to stay with M3 and M4 then. Yes. Yeah, it's Thank a you. very common. Very common and well documented. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very thank good. you very much for the interesting discussion. And then I would now to give the floor to the uh, Professor Kune Su from Ruhr University in Bochum to continue the opposition. Many thanks. Also, many thanks for the nice presentation. I also enjoyed reading the work, so I can really congratulate with your thesis. Particularly when you read uh, or have a lot of background in lattice based crypto and read all the materials you are there, um, you notice it's a lot of ma mathematically written uh, stuff. And so I really enjoyed the more engineering like perspective here in your thesis. Of course, I have also a few questions for you, um, starting with the very first one on modular reduction. Um, there's always a battle between Barrett reduction and Montgomery reduction. Can you elaborate a bit at which point you should actually use the one or the other depending on what type of choices with respect to your expertise on Cortex M4 and M3. Honored sir, uh, thank you for very kind words and um, yeah, that's a good question. So it seems on the course that I've worked on, on the M profile course, you always want to use Montgomery multiplication. So if you do a multiplication, you always want to, to use Montgomery. And for the reductions in the other places after additions or something like that, there you actually have a choice of either using Barrett reduction or using Montgomery reductions. Or sometimes you can just get away with a conditional subtraction or something like that. Um, this is um, hard to answer in general. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on what bounds you need. If you want it to be a standard representative, then you probably go for a buried reduction, sure. followed by a, a conditional subtraction. If you have it somewhere in between, you might want to go for, for Montgomery reductions. Okay, but there's no clear saying it's less cycles with Barrett on the one or the other case, or um, Montgomery. No, actually, both are quite. There, there are nice instructions in the in the, in the Cortex M4 where you can implement both of them. Okay. Um, I think following that, there's also a discussion in your thesis on schoolbook versus uh, Kawatsuba multiplication. I think on page 108, there's a nice figure, figure 5.3. And uh, here you see actually what happens if you consider uh, low polynomial degrees up to 40. Yeah? And I'm wondering, you, you, you discuss the chase between 16 and 60, uh, 36. And I'm wondering what type of parameters are actually in this game? What about the Q? Are there any different aspects which might completely change the situation? So it might go beyond 40 or can you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, so here we were restricting it to 16-bit uh, queues, and it was a power of two. Uh -huh. So it's a power of two queue that is smaller or equal to 16 bits. That was the restriction for this paper. Since that was applying to a lot of candidates in the uh -huh. in the first round of the com NIST competition, um, 
but so what this plot is um, kind of not very conclusive. What I don't like that's what I don't like about this one. And that's the for the school book, it really the amount of hand optimizing you put into plays a huge role. So you can often mm. get it a little bit faster by spending another eight hours in the lab to, to make it faster. So um so there um that's hard to, to say where the crossover is. Of course, this all depends on the available instructions, the multiplication instructions that you have. And this is all on the M4 and there. Um, I think school books are quite easy to implement because you have the perfect instructions that they do like two, two 16-bit multiplications and add the result up. So that benefits school books here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's again hard to say um, how how much you could speed certain degrees up if you spend more time on, on writing better code. Okay, but following one of Professor Verbovede's question on systematization of your ideas, would it be possible to also systematize the approach on Schoolbook to get a better conclusive idea of this uh, diagram? Yeah. So we tried that. Yeah. That we have we have to spend a lot of time writing a Python script that that generates that, mm -hmm. and then you spend a week on writing this Python script, and you look at the code, and you think here I can I can still save some cycles here, and then you end up with a hand optimized one again. So, okay. mm -hmm. and then we we looked at the crypto that we actually wanted to implement, and we see we we basically only need, like two different sizes, um, so that it adds up to to the sizes we need. Um, and then you spend another day on optimizing, hand optimizing those. So. so hand optimization is the key, yes? Yeah, it's also a lot of fun. Okay, okay I see. <laughs> Clearly. Um, okay, coming to the next question. Um, now having looked at Cortex M3 and M4, with respect to Lattice Space Crypto, if you had the chance to influence instruction set of a next generation Cortex, what would be the instructions you would like to suggest? So if you, I mean, mm, actually for the Cortex M4, the instructions are already quite nice. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they, they are very nice to implementing both 16-bit or 32-bit entities. So for that, really, if you have a big multiplier, you're probably good in implementing lattice space crypto fast. Of course, you could have a specialized instruction in there that does your Montgomery multiplication or something like that. But I think lattice space crypto is already so fast that that is probably not the problem that, that we need to. Mm -hmm. Any SIMT extension or something like Neon? Yeah. Sure. I mean, if you want to add a lot of hardware, then yeah. uh, what basically the, the MVE Helium extension is doing, adding a small uh, vector extension to the M profile course, that will be, give you a speed up, of course. That will, will, you can vectorize your entities and that will give you a nice speed up too. Mm. But that is a lot of hardware to, to invest. Okay. Um, my last question is actually one of your slides. I think you, you showed the standardization, which is currently in progress and we hope to have the announcements very soon. Um, of course, there's still a way to go. We need to fix the parameters for the standards. If you now have looked at your implementation of Kyber and Delithium, what would be the changes, if there are any, you would suggest to the authors yeah, with respect to efficiency of the implementation? So I, um, so I have to say that the, the groups behind these two submissions, I think, have a lot of experience in implementing these things efficiently mm -hmm. and uh, they have put a lot of thought into choosing it in a way that it's fast and I think they've done a good job on, on this. Um, for Kyber, I, nothing comes to mind that I would immediately change. Mm -hmm. um, they have had a bunch of changes in the in the past rounds, which I think were all helping in some ways. Same for the lithium; they have changed changed things that are uh, good changes. I think that was more to have a more conservative security. But um, yeah, it, also nothing comes to mind that you would change in the lithium immediately. So performance is fine from your perspective, yeah. So, so for no Kyber, hands. definitely performance is is fine. Also, implementing in, in a stack efficient way is, is is good. For the lithium, it is it is a lot slower, but I guess that's just because signatures are 
more complicated. There are maybe a bunch of tweaks that you could apply to the lithium, and we might maybe have a paper on that soon. Um, you would like to disclose it? Yeah. <laughs> no, so actually in the lithium, um, what dominates the signing is the rejections of your, of mm. your signatures. Yeah. So if, um, and you can minimize this by changing a few parameters, mm. and then you have like half the rejections of what you currently have, mm -hmm. and then try to slope. But we'll see if, um, yeah, when that is, uh, the paper is out, then you can read it. Okay, many thanks, Sander. Thanks. Thank you very much. It seems like your next paper is looking at a good future, if I see the responses in the committee here, if they are in line with reviewers. I would like to continue the opposition with uh, Dr. Boss from NXP Technologies as semiconductors. Thank you. Geachte Pomovendus, yeah, I would also like to thank you for the very interesting thesis indeed. Um, I really like the yeah, applied engineering view uh, on things, yeah, since that's indeed the research we do at NXP as well. Um, my first question is indeed along or extending a bit what Professor Ganesu was asking, but in a different direction. So you were focusing on microcontrollers, M3, M4, um, with the motivation they have not too much memory, uh, simpler instruction sets, but most of the microcontrollers used uh, in practice are actually even smaller, so think an M0. And they really struggle computing public key crypto, even now ECC and RSA, so they've dedicated coprocessors to, to actually help out. What would you suggest, or from based on your experience, what would what kind of hardware would you add uh, to help these much smaller microcontrollers? Arnold, sir, thank you for your kind words. Um, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, I think focusing on the entities is a good idea. That's where we spend a lot of time in, and there you. Basically, if you build something like a vector extension that can, can do multiple of these butterflies in parallel, then you will get a, a nice speed up. So that would be, would be good to have something like that. You could also have a dedicated entity accelerator, um, but I've never looked into this in too much detail. What I should also say is what is quite crazy on these processes is that the, the amount of hashing you do in the schemes dominates the runtime a lot. So you will spend like 60, 70 percent in, in Ketchuk. Um, and then also optimizing it becomes less fun because you can only optimize the part that is, that is not Ketchuk. So if you have a Ketchuk accelerator, you will get a nice speed up for all these schemes. Exactly, yeah, so that's, that is where I wanted to go. So yeah. because people, that's more fun for research, look at the arithmetic, but I guess in practice, indeed, uh, shake or ketchup is indeed really domin the dominating factor. So, yeah. Then, yeah, also for these microcontroller use cases, we often, um, so one of the things you considered is looking at constant time implementations, so where the runtime is uh, independent of the, the secret material. But for high assurance implementations, yeah, we need to do much more, so uh, fault attacks, uh, yeah, higher order sidechannel attacks. Is constant time really relevant then, uh, or is that still very important if you add countermeasures based uh, where you introduce a lot of randomness, like blinding or masking? Of course, you still want your code to be constant time so that um, timing attacks cannot be mounted, and um, countering Timing attacks with, with randomness, it doesn't sound like a, like, like a great idea to me. So I think it should still be, be constant time code. Also, I mean, the code that I've implemented there, um, it's, it's not so expensive to make it constant time for most cases. Okay. Yeah, Except for maybe the lithium where, on the M3 where it was a little bit more tricky. And for the... Protecting Ketchuk, since we were talking about the main operation here, uh, which 80% of the runtime indeed is Ketchuk. What is your feeling there? Um, so, good thing is that uh, Ketchuk is often 
most of the cache like is on public data, public input. Like if you think of Kyber, you spend a lot of time in expanding this public matrix A. So there I don't need any, any side channel protection. Uh, it's just public. For the others, for the, for the secret parts, um, you will, I mean, for constant time, you again have no problem because this is just constant time code. There's, there's no shortcuts that you could take anyway. But there you would add masking and... And what about fault attacks? Fault attacks? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So there you um, have to add some countermeasures. I'm, I'm not too familiar with how you, how you would protect that against fault attacks. For oh, okay. And then, yeah, my last question already. So there, yeah, you did a tremendous amount of engineering work for all these algorithms uh, to map them efficiently indeed to the register set, to the available memory. And I think the biggest result or output there is this integration in this PQM4 framework. Um, but how would you see this research in the future? So how would PQM4, especially also with an eye on, which was already mentioned, RISC-V, um, how would that develop or how do you envision that people can use your research in, let's say, the upcoming five to ten years? So, yeah, I, I think once the standards are picked, um, we have to get this code into, into libraries. And there are a bunch of embedded crypto libraries that would like to, where we could integrate the crypto. I think that's, a, that's the next step to get it, get it into libraries and then people can use it. But there is a lot of work still to do. But how can they benefit from your from your research in this thesis? Well, my, my all my code is uh, open source, so it, you can just take it and put it in your library. I think um, that is one. That, but of course, we've also done a lot of um, studies on how to best multiply these polynomials. So I think we have a good understanding now how you should be implementing Saber, and I think this is also uh, very important that. We now know that maybe Tomb Cook is not the best way to implement this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opposition. And then now we take the chance to move even further abroad to the people who are uh, attending the defense in, uh, uh, in Zoom. And I would like to give the word to Professor Bernstein from the University of Illinois at Chicago in the United States of America. Thanks. Good afternoon, Puma Vendus. Uh, let me begin by joining my colleagues in congratulating you on a very interesting thesis. I um, find it quite unusual for a thesis to tackle something as fundamental as polynomial multiplication, which plays a big role not just in post-quantum cryptography, but in many other applications. And being able to speed up something like that is quite unusual. Um, as has featured in your talk and already on your cover, um, these speed ups involve uh, assembly language. And there's already been some discussion of the work involved in optimizing this assembly language. But I'd like to focus on the question of why use assembly language in the first place? So maybe you could comment on that. Arnold Sir, thank you for your kind words. Um, yeah, no, this is actually a question that you run into quite often is, should I write this in C or should I write this in assembly? And my experience on these, on these um, schemes is that usually the compiler is not so great at, at um, figuring out how to best uh, implement uh, these algorithms. Or you need to be so specific in your C that you might as well also uh, write in an assembly and it's just easier. So I think um, at the very low level for getting fast code, you want to write assembly code to make best use of your available multiplication instructions, to make best use of your registers and to have a, an ideal memory access pattern that you can also then hand optimize to, to save some the last bit of the cycles. I understand what you're saying, but I'd like to contrast this with a uh, very authoritative quote from a website called reddit.com from a user named Danny B, um, who's talking about compilers, and I, I, you're laughing for some reason. Um, he's talking about compilers and saying, uh, we come so close to optimal on most architectures, 
that we cannot do much more without using NP complete algorithms instead of heuristics. We can only try to get little niggles here and there where the heuristics get slightly wrong answers. So niggles, I understand, is some very small improvements. I mean, he's saying that compilers get very, very close to perfect code. And you're saying that, that no, compilers from C, for example, do a, a mediocre job, bad job, and, and you get much better results with assembly language. Um, so how do you explain this contradiction? I think we just have a different understanding of what very close to optimal is. Because if you want to write crypto code, we really want to get the last 10, 15% out of the cycle count. Um, so there I, I really think that um, writing assembly is, is really helpful in getting fast performance. But I should also say uh, that we do see a lot of progress in, in compilers. So over the course of my PhD, um, just compiling reference code from some cryptographic schemes got a lot faster just by upgrading your compiler. So we had students pass their, their assignments by upgrading a compiler instead of writing optimized code. <laughs> but I think for, for some code, it really helps you still to write some code. I'm not sure if I answer, answer your question, but... Well, well, partially. I mean, I understand you're saying that you're, you're getting better results, and part of this is, is just a question of how good the results are, whether you're satisfied with, with some slowdown. But I'm really understanding this quote um, from this Danny B on reddit.com to mean that um, it, it's really, um, I mean, compilers are, are so close to perfect that nobody could possibly care about the difference. And maybe let me um, push on your, your, I mean, 10, 15% or whatever the improvement is. I mean, suppose I told you that this Danny B is actually Daniel Berlin, who's the head of the Google compiler department. Then would you feel like, oh, wait a minute, he must know something about optimizing things that, that um, he, he must have some magic compiler, which is doing a better job, which maybe would fit your story of if you have a better compiler. I mean, maybe he's just using state-of-the-art compilers, and then you wouldn't need to use assembly at all. So I think compilers just have a very different goal. They want to have somewhat good code or good code for a lot of different problems. But here we're looking at a very specific problem of polynomial multiplication, and there we can do a lot better by really understanding how the hardware hardware looks like and how, how we can make the best use of the resources available. I wonder for figuring out whether, um, I mean, so I agree there's different goals for compilers um, and for figuring out whether that's really what's going on is that, I mean, he doesn't actually care about the, you know, getting the best results for this kind of problem. He's, he's looking at a broader class of problems or whether it's quantitatively about the amount of, uh, improvement possible. I, I wonder how we could disambiguate these situations. What would you suggest if somebody's trying to understand what's actually going on in terms of the capabilities of compilers and quantify like, you know, how good is a compiler for this problem and for that problem? And, and are we looking at a question of does it do well across a broad range of domains versus how much does it lose on this particular problem? How would you suggest that people get data on this question? So I think the way we currently do is, this is you throw students at a problem and see how good code they can write. And then you compile this to, uh, compare this to what a compiler can do. So, and there it nowadays often turns out that the students, depending on the students, can do quite a lot better than the compiler. I agree, I agree. And I think this Danny B doesn't know what he's talking about. But uh, <laughs> let me see, if I have a moment more, then I'll ask a different question. And I don't seem to be interrupted yet. So let me ask you about um, something puzzling me on uh, page 61 of your dissertation, where um, in the first paragraph, you mention um, the space of NTTs being very small, the work you do in, in section 3.3, and saying this is a major advantage, the, the small memory usage, um, compared to chapter 5 using a combination of Tunecook and Karatsuba, which comes with a rather large memory footprint. But then on page 105, I noticed that um, you say uh, it's important for Karatsuba to carefully manage memory usage. And then you cite a paper from 2018 doing a completely in-place approach. So it seems that on page 61, Karatsuba memory usage is a problem. 
But on page 105, it's possible that Karatsuba can run in place. So what's going on there? And maybe you can make the answer as efficient as your assembly code. Um. <laughs> Maybe not. So I think the, the core difference is that for Kertuba, if you implement it straightforwardly, it will use a lot of stack space. Whereas for entities, if you implement them straightforwardly, it will be in place because that's faster and it's better anyway. Um, but for Kertuba, there have been some papers that put specific effort into one... Um, one polynomial size and then they optimize. I don't actually remember what that paper from 2018 was doing, but you can put in some effort to also reduce the memory usage of Kartsuba, but I think it will still be less, less efficient than the entities. Maybe. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for the interesting discussion and the uh, extra contribution from anonymous internet users. Um, I would now like to give the floor to Professor Chen from um, University of Surrey in the UK. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Yeah. First, um, dear Mr. Candidate, I would like to join uh, the previous colleagues first uh, to congratulate uh, to your excellent works. It's very impressive to see for a certain amount of time, you have done this big amount of work and with a good qualities. That's excellent. I'm sure after this uh, bigger, um, the PhD, the research period, you probably start to consider your future research directions. So my question is related how you consider uh, your future research. First question is, after your work and the various uh, uh, recent uh, development mentioned in your thesis, is there still room to improve the performance of implementations of polynomial multiplication? Honored That's madam, nice. thank you very much for your kind words. Um, yeah, this is the question that you always ask yourself. Um, can you make, is there more room for improvement? And if you see more room for improvement, then you should improve it and um, not publish your paper yet. So, of course, you always think that the code you have now is optimal. Um, but I've also learned in the past years that sometimes you still find new tricks that can help you. So I, I'm not uh, confident enough to say that we have discovered all the tricks that we can use to make lattice-based crypto fast. It could still be some nice tricks out there that we need to try and get it even a little bit faster. But of course, we have gotten a lot very far already. And in these schemes, if you then see that polynomial multiplication is only taking up 10% and then you have 80% Ketchak and then another 10% something else, then it gets also very frustrating optimizing because then even if you speed up that 10% by um, factor two, you will only get a 5% re reduction in cycles. So, so that's kind of the problem that we run into. And um, so maybe at some point we, we just, um, it's not worth it anymore to optimize it further. But I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we, if there are more surprises in the next years. Okay, yeah. So then this is a, uh, related to the second question is, all your work is about uh, to optimize the implementation, make it uh, more practical. And what is your view about uh, the current uh, post-quantum cryptography algorithms in practice? You, you are more concentrated on the NIST uh, candidates, particularly for those candidates who are likely to be success. Uh, do you think they are actually practical already, or they are still the long way to go to be used uh, like uh, in standard for the small chip like uh, DPM or that kind of thing? 
yeah, so I think for for encrypt for for uh, cams, they are so fast, even on these small chips, that there is there is no real doubt if if the speed will limit uh, the deployment of these. So there, it's then more of the question: Can you handle the the ciphertext size and the and the key sizes? Yeah. And those seem to be also manageable. So um, I think the the lattice based cams that we have today are practical and can be used very soon. For signatures, um, there has been less work, there's less schemes available. So there I will see more, more room for improvement still. Mm -hmm. But speed wise, it's, it's probably also fine on, on like these small cores. Key sizes are even bigger here. Um, so that could be a, be a limit and limiting factor there. But I think in general, lattice based crypto is quite efficient and the teams working on this have put in a lot of thought in selecting the parameters and designing the scheme in the way that it can be practical and they are practical. Yeah, and can you comment about uh, uh, those algorithms? They are outside of NIST competition. They probably appeared after NIST com uh, NIST's uh, uh, submission deadlines. And they claim they are more uh, efficient compared with uh, Mr. Swan. Can, Can you, you give an example? Any of those? Can you give an example of what scheme you're thinking yeah. of? Or? Yeah, like a brace, for example, compared with diligence, the authors claim it's better. I'm not sure which is actually better. Uh, probably people have different views, but at least uh, some people believe this should be in because uh, uh, just because the 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 deadlines or any other reasons. I am not too familiar. I know your work is more concentrated on the uh, ministers, uh, candidates. But also, you mentioned that in your thesis, uh, NISTA is going to have other calls for the future things. Did you ever? Um, pay attention about uh, what possible candidates were likely to be submitted, or because they are already in the in the literature in public domains uh, and uh, with discussion. And and maybe try to keep the answer brief. Okay, so um, yeah, so NIST is calling for more submissions, which is mainly due to some of the submissions um, in the third round suffering some attacks. And that was mainly in the family of MQ-based signatures. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I see this this new call for for signatures is to find another MQ-based signature that they can standardize. So I hope that there, I think there will be a lot of submissions based on MQ. Okay. Very briefly, can you comment uh, other families of uh, PQC? Uh, I know you have worked. Uh, uh, in the rainbow and uh, in the uh, sphinx. Uh, can you comment uh, other families uh, very briefly compared right. with uh, lattice based? Right. So I've mainly worked in on this in this dissertation. I've mainly have the papers on lattice based uh, crypto. Yeah. There are also other families, um, namely MQ based signatures. I have some work on that, uh, mostly on rainbow. Um, I have work on. Hash based signatures, Sphinx and XMSS. Mm -hmm. um, I have also worked a little bit on isogeny based crypto. Um, so, yeah, they all, these all have some advantages and disadvantages. So, I think they're all interesting to look at for, for certain use cases. I'm not sure what exactly you were aiming at, but there's, there's, other, there's other crypto as well that's interesting to implement. Sure. Yeah. So, I'll propose to continue the discussion. Uh, about the future work uh, till after the defense and now uh, give the chance to the members from the digital security uh, group in uh, Radboud to still put some questions to the table. So the first words are to Dr. Samar Jessica. No, thank you. Uh, dear candidate, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, very nice uh, thesis uh, here. So I really liked uh, the language and how clear everything is uh, uh, inside. And uh, to be honest, I will recommend it to students to read a bit about uh, implementation. So into the introduction was really nice. Um, and uh, I would like to zoom in a bit on the 
first page, like on the cover page, no, <laughs> in the butterfly. Uh, so uh, this was, uh, let's say, the main um, the main component of your of your work, uh, uh, working on um, optimizing the entities. But there has been uh, a line of work starting uh, already in 2017 by Primas, and then uh, um, Latin Crypt, uh, and then Chess. Uh, 2021, uh, so a line of work showing uh, that uh, ent uh, the, the entity itself is susceptible to um, side channel attacks, that is uh, uh, one or a uh, few trace uh, side channel attacks that are, uh, uh, that are there just because uh, we are doing uh, the entity. And so um, uh, afterwards, at Space 2020, Ravi and others proposed a masking of the entity. So the masking really gets inside the entity to, to mask it. So could you first uh, comment, because this is already um, uh, an old work, uh, uh, can you comment on whether you considered uh, this masked uh, implementation and what is the impact of that uh, uh, on, on the optimizations that uh, you propose in the, in the thesis? Honored, madam, thank you for your kind words. Which mass work was we were talking about? The, uh, we, uh, the one by Ravi, where they masked the butterfly. So we, they proposed several different masks on the, like exactly on the butterfly with, uh, with these uh, uh, random uh, uh, twiddle constants. Okay, now I remember, uh, thanks. Um, so first I want to say that I don't think these, these single trace attacks on entities are specific to entities. They have studied entities and they work well for entities, but I don't think that this would not work for other polynomial multiplication algorithms. Um, but there is a lot of work now on, on single trace attacks on entities, so that's, that's fair. Um, masking the entire thing doesn't really help um, because the single trace attacks will, will just um, attack each computation on the share separately, so that is not helping. So they propose to randomize inside of the entity. I'm not sure how effective that is. It is a valid thing to do. I think what what uh, papers, the previous um, single trace attack papers propose is more shuffling and reordering the operations, which could also help. But I'm I'm not so I'm I'm not very confident to to say what I would do to protect against these kinds of attacks. I think that needs more, more work. Okay, uh, so basically what, uh, yeah, what can be seen from the results of the paper is that uh, the, the overhead is, uh, is, is quite big. So even for, um, for entity-friendly rings and uh, for entity-unfriendly rings, it would be like huge and uh, I, I think that it would become even less efficient than uh, other um, other multiplication um, methods, like uh, maybe Tom Cook would be would better than. But you also have to protect against these attacks then, so yeah, that maybe. is an interesting area of future work to see. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, interesting. Yes, so, uh, yeah, okay, so thank you. <laughs> that was it, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Maybe we can continue the opposition immediately with Professor Bettina. Yes, very quickly. Uh, uh, dear candidate, thanks for your uh, nice thesis and uh, presentation, but let's quickly get to the question, which also has to be very short. So I, I had many questions in my head, but then kind of a uh, new pop-up, because when this uh, discussion with uh, Montgomery versus Barrett came in, then you were like uh, saying, yeah, Barrett, and you could get away with conditional subtraction maybe. But then I heard you also saying today, and also in your thesis several times, how timing, constant timing attacks are important. So how can you then get away with conditional subtraction? Honored, madam, for, thank you for your kind words. Um, yeah, so luckily there is a way to do constant time uh, conditional subtractions on these microcontrollers. So, with uh, apologies to the local committee members for not completing all my tasks perfectly as a rector, um, I would like to close the defense uh, with the following words. So the defense is hereby concluded, and I give the floor once again to the candidate. 
Having defended my dissertation to the best of my ability, I would like to thank the rector and my supervisors, as well as those who have honored the ceremony, ceremony with their presence. The doctoral examination board retreats for its deliberations. On behalf of the doctoral board of Radboud University Nijmegen, we have decided to award you the degree of doctor. I invite Professor Schwabe to discharge the task assigned to him. In the name of the Lord, with the power entrusted by the law to the doctorate board, I hereby confer upon you, Matthias Julius Kanwischer, born in Tübingen, the title of doctor from Radboud University Nijmegen, to which are attached all the associated legal and customary rights and duties with respect to academia and society. As proof thereof, I present you with this doctoral diploma signed by the rector and the doctoral thesis supervisor. I hereby congratulate you and your family on behalf of the doctoral board. I would like to, uh, to ask the guests to rise and we will close the ceremony. Gracias tibi acimus, omnipotens Deus, pro omnibus beneficius tuis. Qui vivis et regnas per omnia saecula saeculorum. And I think I should first have given you the word for the laudatio. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but for the laudatio, I'm supposed to think to sit down and use the microphone, it says there. Let's all sit down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's at least the instructions here in the, in the back. So, Dr. Kanwischer, dear Matthias, congratulations. The day today, this defense and the degree of doctor can certainly be seen as the end of a journey. A journey that took you over six of the seven continents of this world, where you were employed at four different places, and where you collaborated with many very different people. But let's start at the beginning. From my perspective, the beginning was an email you sent to me on October 11, 2017, starting with the world's words, hello. I'm a PhD student at the University of Surrey and have just started working on the efficient implementation of post-quantum, of quantum-resistant cryptographic schemes under the supervision of Professor Li Chin Chan. In that mail, you pointed out two mistakes in the preprint version of the Kyber paper, which we had put online a few months before. What's a bit embarrassing for me, from my side is that I did, I did find that email still, but I didn't find any reply from me. Should I really not have replied to that email? <laughs> then for some reason you must have forgiven me. 
at least you didn't seem to be too angry when we met a couple of months later at a research retreat at the seaside in Tenerife. During this retreat, we started working on PQM4, a project that has been mentioned a couple of times also during the defense today, testing a benchmarking framework for post-quantum cryptography in the ARM Cortex-M4 that would later run like a common thread through your PhD trajectory. More importantly, though, on one of the last evenings of this retreat over dinner, you told me that you have the feeling that the group in Surrey isn't quite the right place for you to do the kind of work that you wanted to do. And you asked me if by any chance I would have an open position. Unfortunately, I did not. To continue work on PQM4 and other PQ projects, you first came to Nijmegen for a six-week research visit. And it was then in early June 2018 when I learned that my VD proposal was granted and that as a result, I would actually have a position for you. It went very fast and you started in July 2018 with what I would call the rug belt stretch of your PhD. From the beginning, in fact, I think already during that dinner in Tenerife, you expressed that you're eager to travel and see the world during your PhD. And I think it's fair to say that you did. Within the first year at Radboud University, you traveled to four continents. There was South America for ACNS, North America for real world crypto, Africa for Africa Crypt, and Australia for Kanga Crypt. What was still missing then was Asia, but we'll get back to that. First, you continued doing great work in Nijmegen, started new collaborations, and became more and more independent. Just for a bit of bin counting, out of 16 papers you list your, on your website, I co-authored only five. Then came 2020, a year that dramatically changed the world, changed how we live, how we interact, and also changed quite a bit in your PhD trajectory. In January 2020, before any of us really knew what the word pandemic really meant, we were in New York for real world crypto. During that conference, I told you that I might move to Bochum and start at the newly founded Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy. And I asked you to think about if you would then want to join and also move to Bochum with me. I don't think you thought for a very long time, but told me that you'd be up for such a move. About a month later, I left for what was planned to be a four month sabbatical in Porto, and you left for what was planned to be a six week research visit in Taipei. Oh boy, did those plans change. While I returned early from a sabbatical to spend the first lockdown in Europe at home, your visit in Taipei went on for a bit longer, like half a year longer. Your flights get, kept getting canceled, your visa kept getting extended, Taiwan was not in lockdown, and as far as I understood, life was much better there than in lockdown in Europe. And well, I guess it got even better when you met John Allen. Also, you kept doing impressive work, collaborating a lot with Boyin and his students, writing one chess paper after the other, so we were in silent agreement that there wasn't much of a reason for you to come back. Quite possibly, you would have stayed in Taiwan until now, but there was, of course, still that move to MPI in Bochum. You had decided to start there in October, and for some weird reason, German employers require their employees to actually show up for work. So this is how the next stretch, the very short Bochum stretch, of your PhD trajectory started. You came in October, and the first two months or so were fine, but then Germany went back into a lockdown. And it was very clear that you'd much rather be in Taiwan than locked up in a small student apartment in Bochum. There was a bit of paperwork to be done, because the Max Planck Society at the time actually had a complete travel ban on all work travel. But after less than three months in Bochum, you were back in Taipei. When your visa there at some point didn't get extended anymore, the solution to stay longer was to change employer once more, quit your contract at MPI, and start at Academia Sinica. So while the defense today is sort of an end to your PhD journey, the transition into the next stretch is rather smooth. You're going to continue working at Academia Sinica as a postdoc with Buhin. I must say that for me, this is very exciting, not just because it obviously reminds me of what I did after my PhD, uh, for those who are, don't know, I went for a postdoc with Bojin to Taipei at Academia Sinica, but also because you're the first of my students graduating here who decided to stay in Academia. I'm very much looking forward to following what you're going to do over the next years. I'm sure there's lots of cool papers ahead, quite possibly several pictures from Taiwan showing up in my signal messages and that will make me envy you. 
And hopefully, sometime soon, the quarantine rules will be relaxed a bit more, and I will be able to visit you in Taipei again. Matthias, I wish you all the best for this exciting next stretch of your journey. And again, congratulations, Gongxi, and ganz herzlichen Glückwunsch. Thank you, Professor Schwaber. So, in this hybrid setup of a defense, it's still a bit awkward how you then complete the ceremony. So we have come to the conclusion that it is uh, really nice to give now the opponents from abroad who participated in uh, the Zoom session and the supervisor abroad who participated in the Zoom session the chance to say uh, a, a brief words of congratulations. So first words to uh, Professor Bernstein. Dr. Kondager, um, congratulations, first of all. I noticed that in the um, comments in, attached to the code that was archived along with your thesis, you wrote Kartsuba instead of Karatsuba. So there was, in fact, a typographical error related to your dissertation. Despite that, I consider the dissertation an extremely impressive piece of work, and I look forward to seeing what you produce in the future. Congratulations again. Professor Chen? Congratulations, Matthias. Uh, yes, I'm glad that you made a good decision uh, shortly after you uh, doing your PhD in Surrey, and you decided uh, uh, this Surrey uh, is not the right place because none of us are doing implementation, and you are the uh, one very passionate about doing implementation, and you obviously have uh, uh, cap uh, the good uh, capability to do this. I think you, are, um, you have a long way to go. You will achieve quite a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to see you in the future. And Professor Young? Oh, microphone? <laughs> You're muted. So, Dr. Kambisher or Matthias, um, congratulations, um, you deserved it. Um, if we had been more careful, maybe you could have been cum laude, but, uh, well, I mean, uh, some things uh, go wrong. And uh, for the most part, uh, things went perfectly uh, in Taiwan. I mean, uh, there are things that were small bumps in the road, such as uh, when you try to get on the airplane back to Taipei and then you found that you had COVID. Uh, and, and there is the stretch of the time in Taipei that we have to provide you with food. But uh, all that is past, and uh, I look forward to the uh, coming year when I'll be working with you and uh, I look very much forward to seeing how you do academically. Thank you very much. And then I would like to once again congratulate the candidate and his family uh, with the degree and ask everybody to rise. Just for consistency. <laughs> Gratias tibi agimus, omnipotens deus, pro omnibus beneficis tuis, qui vivis et regnas per omnia, saecula saeculorum.